The passage of Scripture I'd like to begin with comes interestingly from Luke chapter 23 at verse 38. And this passage, of course, takes us to the cross of Christ while the Son of God is there crucified. And here Luke records this observation about the scene at the cross. In Luke 23, verse 38, Luke writes, And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Well, I wanted you to see this passage about the superscription written above the head of our Savior as he was crucified on Calvary's cross for our sins. And you notice that it is in three languages. Luke tells us it was in Greek and in Latin and in Hebrew. And it said, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. There you actually got four languages because we have it in English because we're privileged to have the English translation of the Bible. Greek was the language of the common people. When Alexander the Great conquered the world in the 4th century BC, the Greek language was spread throughout the empire. It was the language of business or commerce. It was the language of travel and geography. The spread of the Greek influence carried with it a nigh universal language. It came to be known, contrasted to patristic Greek and classical Greek, as Koine Greek, which simply means common Greek. It was spoken everywhere in the world. That's the language that this phrase, this is Jesus the King of the Jews, appeared in in the superscription above the head of Christ. Now you know the superscription was the accusation of the one who was crucified. This is what his claim was, and it was certainly true. But also you'll notice it was written in Hebrew. Hebrew is the language of the Old Testament. The entirety of the Old Testament is in Hebrew, except for a few Aramaic sec sections, the largest of which is Daniel 2, 4 through Daniel 7 and verse 28. A, the uh, language there is a kindred to the Hebrew, and it's known as Aramaic. And then also it was written in Latin. Latin is the official language of the empire, the Roman Empire. Latin was the language used in Rome and in Italy at the time. It was the language that was the official language. Latin has become a dead language in that after the fall of the Roman Empire, it was not commonly spoken. And so it's a frozen language. In that same sense, the Koine Greek is a frozen language. It's not the language that is spoken in Greece today, for example. Well, in thinking about the first English Bible, I wanted to present to you the three languages that are present in our Bible. Old Testament largely in Hebrew, New Testament largely in Greek. Now it's quite interesting for us that through the years, these languages found a way to be translated into the language of the people. In previous studies we saw that the Bible in its entirety today has been translated into 670 languages and dialects. Right before this program, I was speaking to one of the missionaries we support on his way back home to the Philippines. And he was talking about getting Bibles in the Filipino language. So while you have Spanish as a language, the Filipino language is its own language. And so the whole Bible, as of today, has been translated into 670 languages and dialects. Taking the New Testament by itself, the New Testament has been translated into 1,521 languages and dialects. We are especially grateful that we have the Bible in English as we have it here before us because that is our vernacular or mother tongue as it is called. And without the Bible being in, in English, we wouldn't know its great teachings. Think with me for just a minute what this means. By looking at the Psalms, we find, for example, in Psalm 1, Blessed is the man that standeth not, that walketh not in the way of sinners, nor standeth in the way of the scornful, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Look at Psalm 19 in verse 11, where the psalmist declares, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Or turn to Psalm 19. And there you can look down Psalm 19 in verse 89, where the psalmist said that the throne of God is justice and judgment 
and or the habitation of his throne. Noticing the place of God's word about his throne. Or in that passage in 97, Psalm 119 verse 97, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. And perhaps all of us from childhood have known verse 105 of that chapter, which says, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my pathway. Or Psalm 119 verse 130, The entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Think about those passages and what they say. If we didn't have an English copy of the Bible and we didn't read Hebrew, we wouldn't know what that was about. We would not have the privilege of having that information. But because we do have the Bible in English, we have all of the great truths of the Bible handy and readily available to us. It's a phenomenal blessing for us to have the Bible in English. Today I want to talk about the first English translation of the Bible. When you go back in history, there's a chart that I have that I'd like to present to you if I might. This chart is found in this copy of the Bible I have before me here. It's called the Thompson Chain Reference Bible. And on page 1528 uh, of this book, you have the chart, a, par a portion of which you're able to see on the screen. This is uh, page 1585, excuse me. Now this chart right here tells you the origin and growth of the English Bible. And looking right at this page, I wanted you to have the privilege of seeing what I'm seeing on the page in the Thompson Chain Reference Bible. You'll notice at the bottom of the chart, it has original manuscripts in the date 1500 B.C. to 100 B.C. That's the period of time in which the Bible was writing from the date of Moses in 1500 B.C. to the close of the first century when all 66 books of the Bible found their completion. Just above that, there's a little scroll that says early copies, and it has the Alexandrinus, the Vaticanus, and the Sinaiticus. And you notice these are from the 3rd and 4th centuries A.D. Now, of course, we'll not have time in this program to explore the entirety of this chart. It's a complicated chart, as you might notice. But I want you to notice that the books on the bottom are the basis of the books on the top. That is, they provide the source material used for the different translations. For example, to the right hand of it, you'll see the Dead Sea Scrolls and newly discovered manuscripts down there at the bottom. Well, those have been consulted in the translations that are on that shelf above there. And uh, they have been, these facts to the bottom right, have been employed in the use of these translations to help them understand which passages are accurate. Well, the stack of books you see on the left, where we want to do, what we want to do now is look at these ancient copies, and we're looking for the very first one of these English translations. These are all English translations. We want to look at the very first one. They're ancient copies, and there are many ancient copies of the New Testament. The number ranges into the tens of thousands for these copies because not all of them are complete. Some of them are individual books, some are fragments, but the ancient copies constitute a wealth of source material. And from them, the ancient versions. Now, they're not listed there, but they would include the Ethiopic and the Coptic and the Syriac translations or versions. They come from about the third century. Notice as we move forward in time, we come to one called the Vulgate. You see that there? 400 A.D. The Vulgate was translated by a man named Jerome in 400 A.D. And he used particularly one manuscript, and that would be the Codex Vaticanus that was associated with the Vatican. And he translated from the Vatican manuscript, which was Greek, into Latin. And his translation serves as the basis of other English translations. Now, before we get to Wycliffe, you see Wycliffe there, 1380, it's actually 1382. Let me tell you about the development of the English Bible. About the 7th century, it's quite interesting for us to know that history tells us there was a man by the name of Cadman. And he took some of the stories of the Bible from Genesis to the days of the apostles, and he brought them into English. He was an unlearned man, and he just wanted people to have the ability to know some of these stories. So this is not a complete Bible. It's just a first attempt 
at bringing some of this material that was originally in Latin, the Vulgate was Latin, bringing that into a language people could read. Now, we're going back to the 7th century, so we're not talking about modern English as we know it, or even Old English, but Old English comes from Anglo-Saxon and develops into Old English. If you've ever read original copies of Geoffrey Chaucer, for example, in the 15 and 1600s, you'll know that that's almost like a foreign language in itself because the English language was developing. But back in the 7th century, people saw the need to have information from the Bible in a language they could read. Not everyone read Latin that the Vulgate was in. Also at this period of time, the year is 709, there's a man by the name of Aldheim. And Aldheim translated some of the Psalms from Latin into English. And he goes down in history for doing that. No one else had done that. Following Aldheim then, there comes a man by the name of Bede. He died in 735. And Bede translated some of the Gospels. In fact, I think it was the Gospel of John that he translated from Latin into English. These are the first expressions of bringing the Hebrew, Greek, or the Latin translation into English. Seven centuries after these books were written, people were beginning to get them in their own language. It's not until we get to own up to the time of John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe is the first one to translate the Bible into English, and he does so in its entirety. The year is 1380, actually 1382, John Wycliffe. He translates the Bible from the Latin Vulgate into English, first time, 1382. I want to let you know that this represents to me one of the greatest atrocities ever fostered on humanity. That because largely of the lack of education or ignorance and an unwillingness on the part of those who were the dominant religion at the time, the Bible was kept out of the hands of the common people. Now we've always had a copy of the Bible. I have this nice copy my father gave me of this Bible I've been talking to you about. And we can read and study it. We are privileged to have the Bible because in these ancient times, the Bible was only scarcely translated into a language that anyone that spoke English could read. And as a result, people were kept in darkness. We have to know the truth in order to be made free, John 8, 32. And without the Bible, without a knowledge of the Bible, people would be forever lost. That's why I say it is one of the greatest atrocities ever fostered on humanity not to have available to them a copy of the Bible. What a tragedy to be so ignorant of the Bible and unaware of one's condition before God. Ignorance is no excuse. People will not be able to say, well, I didn't have a copy of the Bible because the Bible says in the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. In the book of Acts chapter 17, verse 29 and 30. So here you have a man who steps up. His name, as we've said, is John Wycliffe. And he translates the Bible from Latin into English. First English translation, 1400s. As a result of this, I think it is horrible for us to notice that as an official act of the Roman Catholic Church, he was, after he died, he was exhumed, that is, his bones were dug up. He was placed on trial by the Roman Catholic Church, and he was sentenced to die. He's already dead, but he was sentenced as a heretic. For what? For copying, for translating the Bible from Latin, the Vulgate, into English. And his ashes were scattered on the River Swift. This is the year 1428. John Wycliffe did the world a service, the English-speaking world a service, for being known as the very first person to translate the Bible into English. The first English Bible was an action performed by John Wycliffe in 1382. And for that, the Roman Catholic Church ostracized, excommunicated him, and after his death, put him on a, his bones on a mock trial, burned those bones, and scattered the ashes in the River Swift. Why would the Roman Catholic Church do that? They didn't want the Bible in the hands of the common people. That is the reason as to why they did that. 
This period of time from 500 to 1500 is known as the Dark Ages because of the suppression of the Word of God and the primary culprit here is the Roman Catholic Church. Now you may be a Roman Catholic and you're listening to me. There needs to be the idea of a grand apology to humanity for keeping the Bible out of the hands of people. That needs to be something that goes with it. If you're in a church that has been responsible for that, there are apologies that need to be made for that action. And that is just part of the culture of the Roman Catholic Church. There are 1.2 billion people in the Roman Catholic Church today. So many people are just overlooking that fact. But it is unfortunate that that is the historical accuracy and truth of the matter. The man's name is John Wycliffe. The action is in 1428 for a man who translated the first English translation of the Bible, John Wycliffe, in 1382. Now, if we go back to our chart, let me notice something else with you on the chart here. Another person who brings this, the Bible into English is a man by the name of William Tyndale. William Tyndale is the first to translate the Bible into English directly from the Hebrew and the Greek. Now, he does that in the year 1525, and he does the Old Testament, that's the Hebrew, in the year 1525. Five years later, he translated the New Testament and brought that into English. So the whole Bible was translated by William Tyndale into English by the year 1530. Again, as a footnote here, the Catholic Church tried him for heresy for doing that and burned him at the stake October the 6th, 1536. Can you imagine that? Here we finally got the Bible in a language we can actually read. Now, if we read Latin, we're in good shape. And a lot of people were educated and could read Latin during that period of time, but the common man could not. And so here you'll have the Bible translated into English, and the Catholic Church wants to withhold the Bible from humanity. So what do they do? For translating the Bible from Hebrew and Greek into English by the year 1530, the Roman Catholic Church tries William Tyndale and convicts him as a heretic and literally burned him at the stake. October 6, 1536. These were far different times than we know of today in our own time. A time when the seclusion and suppression of the Bible was the major driving factor behind the Roman Catholic Church. Do you realize it was not even until the year 1962 with Vatican II Council that the Roman Catholics allowed their people to study something that wasn't written without an imprimatur from the Pope in the front of it, an imprimatur or seal of approval by Rome. You had to have the Pope's approval or some archbishop or cardinal's imprimatur or stamp of approval on any religious book that you would read. If you didn't have that, you were not allowed to read it. That continued, ladies and gentlemen, all the way up till the year 1963. Only then were Catholics freed up to read books that were not approved by the Roman Catholic Church. That idea of the suppression of the Bible and study books connected to the Bible, unless they were Catholic, persisted until just about 50 years ago. I think it's an atrocity. And I think our Catholic friends need to stand up and admit the error of their ways in regard to the church of which they're a member. Because without the Bible... People are being kept out of heaven and kept from doing God's will. It was be a Catholic and submit to us or die and perish. That's the fact. Those are historical facts. Think of what we have through the labors of these people. We've talked about John Wycliffe and we talked about William Tyndale who brought the first English translations to us. And because of that, People have been able to read and study the Bible for themselves and to see what the Bible has to say, to learn some of those great principles that I mentioned to you a minute ago about how standing in the counsel of God is a wonderful privilege to be so blessed. To implant the Word of God in our hearts because we have it in our own language is a high and noble privilege for us. People have sacrificed their lives to bring the Bible into English. Now, across time, there have been many translations that have emerged. Today, some of the wording, English wording of our Bibles, is based upon the translation of William Tyndale. He continues today, some 500 years after he has given us this English translation, to influence the translations of the Bible that we have. It's remarkable that these Bibles 
and these works of translation on the, on the part of these men have served as a basis for many of the translations of the Bible. If we could go again to the chart with these various translations on it, I'd like to notice them with you. On the bottom left, notice the Latin Vulgate. You see that where it says 400 AD, bottom left? Above that, there is John Wycliffe's translation, uh, 18, uh, 1380. Above that, William Tyndale, 1526. After that, there were a series of Bibles written, translated in English. The Coverdale Bible, 1535. Matthew's Bible, 1537. The Great Bible, it was called the Great Bible because of its size, 1539. The Geneva Bible, 1560. The Bishop's Bible, 1568. And then there is the Reims Douay version of the Bible, 1610. Notice that is an English translation that is taken directly from the Latin Vulgate. Directly from the Latin Vulgate. If you can see that horizontal column, that's what that is intended to display for you. One of the weaknesses of the Douay version is it is a translation of the Latin and not the original Greek. And remember, the Vulgate comes to us from one Greek manuscript, the Vaticanus manuscript, whereas these others are beginning to take advantage of all of the many hundreds and thousands of manuscripts that are available to make sure you have the text in an accurate way. From the Geneva Bible and the other Bibles that preceded it come the famous King James Version of the Bible in 1611. And uh, the Bible that I usually read out of on this program is the King James Version of the Bible. Many of the archaisms in the King James Version have been updated in more recent publications of it, but it remains essentially the same. Other translations include the Revised Version of 1881, that is an English work, that is from the United Kingdom, and then based upon that here in America, the American Standard Version of the Bible from 1901. These are reliable and accurate translations of the Bible. Now, we have the Reims Douay, the Catholics still have that translation of the Bible, but we don't so much see the bishops, Geneva, Matthews, and other Bibles, but we have the King James Version of the Bible. It continues to be one of the best-selling Bibles throughout the English world because of its scholarship and its trueness to the text. And of course, it is a translation. Now, these translations are done by men, but you may recall that in our previous study together, we saw how that the Septuagint version was a version of the Bible, a translation of the Hebrew Bible done by 70 men. And yet, Christ and the apostles quote from the Septuagint version and refer to it as the Word of God. That is one thing I wanted to really make clear in these studies that we're doing now on Bible translations, is that where you have a translation of the Bible that accurately translates the original text, you have the Word of God. You haven't missed something. You have what the Word of God says. It just happens to be in your language. In the same sense as the superscription above the head of Christ in Luke 23, 38 said, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And there's no speculation or question about what it said. We understand that in English, that's the same identical thing you would understand if you read it in the Greek, the Latin, or the Hebrew. So it is possible to have an accurate translation. And that's what we have in these, the King James and the American Standard versions of the Bible. The American Standard Version has been hailed as the most accurate literal translation of the Hebrew and Greek text. The King James translation is hailed as being the most readable accurate translation. Many of you may have a King James Version of the Bible. Being raised, studying, and reading out of the King James Version of the Bible, I really don't identify when somebody says, I don't understand the King James, for I've been schooled in it and trained in it. And often when I'm reading it, if there's a word that is an archaic word, I'll give the updated English word even as we read and go through the translation itself. Today, I wanted you to see the first English Bible. The first English Bible translation was the translation that was done by John Wycliffe, and the year is 1382. That was taken from the Latin language, the Latin Vulgate. The second English Bible and the first English Bible translation that came from the original languages, being Hebrew and Greek, was the work of William Tyndale, 
and it came about and was completed by the year 1530. Since then, we've had the King James Version, 1611, the American Standard Version, 1901, and then there have been many updated or modern translations, many, many times to take away the archaisms of the older translations. Sometimes, as we've seen in our chart, to notice that the new discoveries that have been made have been consulted in the translations of the Bible, and so many people have those updated modern English translations. There is a caution I would like to offer before we close today about a modern translation of the Scripture. The ends of the spectrum that I would be speaking about to make this clear would have to do with a literal translation of the Bible. On the end of this spectrum, you'll have the King James Version of the Bible, for example. And then on the other end of the spectrum might be Moffat's translation or the New International Version or the Living Bible Paraphrase. These are paraphrases or thought translations. The writer or the translator's purpose is not to give the literal translation of the text, what does the Hebrew and Greek say in English, but rather what the thought conveyed is. And so these are more on the commentary plane than they are the actual text of the Bible. And I want you to know about that. That's the difference between, for example, the popular King James Version and the New International Version. One is a literal translation. The other is a thought translation and said to be so in the preface. Next time, I'd like for us to spend a little bit more time looking at the value of a reliable translation of the Bible. But for today, I wanted to emphasize the point that we have the Bible in English. And what that means to you and me is we have readily accessible to us God's Word, His will, from Genesis to Revelation. And Paul encourages us in Ephesians 3, 4 by saying, When ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. We have the privilege of understanding the Bible today and reading it. Many times people read through the entirety of the Bible in one calendar year. And as a result of that, a greater knowledge of the Bible comes forward. We learn that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but that fools despise wisdom and instruction, Proverbs 1.7. And we know also that the New Testament, the Apostle Peter, encourages us all to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3, verse 18. Now that's one way we know that Peter was not the head of the Roman Catholic Church. He wanted people to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, not to have the Bible secluded and suppressed and withheld from them. Oh, Peter would have nothing to do with the church of that type. No, sir, not at all. What a wonderful privilege it is for us to have the Bible. By reading it, we can learn what to do to become a Christian. We can learn how to live the Christian life. We can learn how to worship God in harmony with God's truth. There are a lot of things that we take for granted. May one of them never be our own copy of the Bible, the Word of God. Thank you so much for your attention to this study today and for reviewing this chart with me and noticing that we have God's Word in our own language. Please return again.